What is going on guys? Vanity here, back with volume 23 of the In The Style Of series, this time reverse engineering the sound of Burial. This is the composition I'll be taking you through today. As I've stated before in this series in regards to other artists, only Burial can truly do Burial, which is the way it should be. Note the series title in the style of, not I am Burial. I try to base this composition around Burial's deeply personal autobiographical record, Untrue, which only a few days ago passed its 10 year anniversary. According to the late Mark Fisher's profile in The Wire, Burial wrote Untrue in just two weeks, which is just about a track a day. Any producer will know that that's a pretty incredible writing speed, but that's not what most intrigues me. I think this highlights Burial's total lack of perfection. He doesn't aim for perfection like most of us. In fact, he highlights his work's imperfections, and that's what we love about him. He chooses to be guided by how well his tracks capture a particular feeling, moment, or emotion. If you take anything away from this tutorial, let it be that. Something I'd like to start explaining in these tutorials is my philosophy behind how I approach putting these compositions together. I believe that this was particularly important in the creation process of this track, especially the sonic world. The sonic world is what some may call the musical ambience. It's everything contained in this world group here. The group contains all other musical sounds, the pads, atmospheres, drones, etc. I refer to this collectively as the world, as I like to think of it as creating a musical world, much like how film composers approach scoring for a film project. They're in charge of creating a sonic world for the given movie. They direct the emotions and the feelings of the audience in line with the visuals and take the viewers on a journey through their created world. The recently released Blade Runner 2049 soundtrack contains undertones of burial. I haven't yet had a chance to watch it, but I'm sure the film, combined with the soundtrack, will provide you with both a visual and audio example of creating your own world. 
I think it's fair to say that not every track takes the listener on a journey into their world, and that's fine, but Burial's music is a different story. I started with trying to create this musical world, more condensed than what you'll hear in Burial's music, but I think it gives you a pretty good example. I've got five channels of separate sounds, six in total. I'll play you them all together, and then one by one, while showing you the processing contained on each channel. However, remember that the processing isn't all that important in this composition, but the emotions captured and portrayed are. Here's how the group sounds all together. Now each sound separately, starting with the stretched out pad texture. As I went through the channels, you could see the effects I've applied on each channel, consisting of just an EQ, compressor, or both. I won't talk about each individually, as the same concept has been applied to each. I'm stripping away frequencies that are not needed, so everything below 100Hz, as well as the reverse in the high end. On the sounds that need it, I'm using a compressor to ensure the dynamics of the sound are controlled, meaning it stays at the same consistent amplitude. Learning how to control the dynamics of each sound in your mix, if you're not already, will make the biggest difference to how your mix sounds are sounding, so that's something I'd pay a lot of attention to. The bulk of the processing has been applied on the group, which I will speak about in more detail. I think that it's first important to note that I've mixed this track from feeling, not from any technique or principles. My goal was to get this composition as close to the sound of Burial as I could, and I'm sure, as you all know, Burial does not follow any mixing rules or given principles besides his own. You may not associate clean mixes with Burial, perhaps that comes from him actually going out of his way to make them sound old and worn out through using vinyl tape effects, as well as low quality sampling and various filtering techniques. However, each sound does occupy its own space in the frequency spectrum, so to me at least, it doesn't sound cluttered or messy, more like a jigsaw that fits neatly together with some overlapping edges. Back to the processing. 
The EQ is rolling everything out under 100Hz to make way for the bass and the bottom end of the kick drum. When you're using the amount of atmospheres as Burial does, things can get quite problematic in this low end region very quickly. I wanted to keep the bass fairly quiet in terms of its amplitude, but to also ensure it was easily heard and translated across different mediums. This EQ ensured that that was possible, but we'll get into this a little more when I discuss the bass. The glue compressor is, as the name implies, gluing all of these sounds together by controlling the dynamics of each simultaneously. When mixing, this is critical, as if something is jumping around in volume, you cannot mix it against something else without continuously making adjustments, and you'll see this repeated throughout the whole project. I'm using this utility plugin to automate the volume down by 7.5 decibels just before the drums kick in. I found Burial's transitions from no drums to introducing the drums very seamless. There wasn't anything to give you an indication that they were just about to be introduced. This does come at the exception of a few tracks on Untrue, in where he automated a low pass filter on the drums, but it's so quiet it's hardly noticeable unless you are listening for it. I'm personally not a huge fan of being able to predict where a new sound or instrument is going to be introduced. Most of us are of course accustomed to this through using the timing and bar count of the track. Burial's music is unpredictable and unstructured in terms of 8 bar counts, or any type of bar counts in fact. This is a style choice but it's also because he produces his music in Sony's SoundForge software which is not a door like Ableton. The biggest notable difference being that it doesn't follow a grid system for creating music. Burial's tracks seem to just flow with the introduction of new instruments seamlessly blending together in his sonic world. I've attempted to recreate this by using a couple of different ideas or techniques. The first I guess is the obvious one, turning the grid off or not working in an 8 bar structure. You'll see from looking Looking at the arrange page here, that I've got sounds coming in on different bar counts than the norm. Also, the notes on the vocal pad here are completely unquantized. I simply played this composition on loop and just recorded what I felt or sounded right without paying attention to the bars or the timing of the track. Drawing in notes makes this harder, so I'd recommend trying to play in as much live as you can. Now, I've paired this technique with overlapping the starts of some sounds with the middle of others to mask a new instrument being introduced. So, for example, you can see here how this textured sound comes in to hide the ending or looping of this sound, which is also in turn hiding the end of the vocal pad above it. You must also be aware of how many sounds are playing at any given time. Burial does use tons of sounds in each composition, but they're not all playing at the same time. If you're finding that introducing brand new instruments into the mix is a little jarring or not quite as smooth as you'd like, you can introduce them gradually, either by building in pitch or volume. I've applied this technique to the vocal pad. You can see how the notes slowly rise in octaves until the highest notes here becomes audible. Because you've subconsciously been hearing the sound in the background at a different pitch for a few minutes now, when the highest note is introduced, it sounds much more fluid and natural. So that's everything I'd like to say on the first group. The sounds contained within the next group go hand in hand with those that I've just covered, so it makes sense to speak about them next, and they are the effects group. To further simplify this group, the sounds could be split into two categories. The first is the effects that play throughout the whole project, so the top four channels here, and the second section are the effects that come in and out throughout the project to provide added ambience, depth, and interest. This bacon sound here has an interesting backstory, which I'll get to in just a second. I'll play you the group in its entirety, and then take you through everything individually. So here's how the whole group sounds. and then everything separately.
I guess the vinyl crackle doesn't need much explanation, other than that I've pitched it down a semitone, duplicated it, panned one left and the other right to put it right out on the outsides of the mix. This gives it a much larger and closer sound and it also means it doesn't get swallowed up in the mix as it's right on the edges of the track. The tape piece here is also pitched down an octave as both the hiss and the crackle just stood out too much for me at their original higher pitches. The goal with both of these sounds were to blend them into the track. Keeping them at their original higher pitches made them stick out above the rest of the sounds contained within the project. They didn't sound like they belonged or were part of the same composition. Now, the sound titled Bacon is a recording of bacon in a frying pan, which gives off a similar sound to that of a vinyl crackle, only higher in pitch. The interesting backstory to this sound that I mentioned earlier is that Burial supposedly uses this in his own compositions, often mistaken for vinyl crackles. I personally believe that he uses a mixture of both, but while studying music production at university, I met a person that knew Burial. I'll put new in inverted commas for now. I cannot, of course, confirm this, but it is an interesting technique if true. It's something I decided to play around with and ended up keeping it in the track. I have pitched it down by two octaves, as you can see here, purely because the original sound was just too high in pitch, much like the tape and vinyl crackle. These are also the three sounds that play throughout the whole composition. The next four sounds are added effects that play only for a few seconds and are repeated throughout the track just to add interest and variation. The textures, or effects as some may call them, in Burial's tracks don't just all play at once, cluttering up the mix. They come in and out throughout each track, as I mentioned earlier. Sometimes this is a sudden change, while other times they're introduced with volume automation or on a transition. The thunder and rain sample in here only play in what I'd call the introduction or before the drums are introduced. If I zoom in, you can see that the thunder and rain sample has been chopped up without any gradual fades in or out, just sudden starting and end points. I've chopped out the more quiet parts while keeping the loud ones. I wanted the sample to sound raw and almost like the chops are mistakes to emulate that natural sounding quality of Burial's music. The sample, much like all of the others in this track, have been pitched down two octaves and were taken from freesound.org. Combining these longer, more drawn out effects with the much shorter ones is something Burial incorporates a lot in his music. I ensured that I had a combination of both as I think this is an important element in his sound. These short effects are almost signaling something happening in the sonic world. It takes our attention away from the main musical bed splitting up the track. The next effect, which I've titled Static, is simply a recording of some radio static that has been pitched down two octaves and cut into these tiny chunks that repeat throughout the track. Here's how it sounds again. I've got three plugins on here to further manipulate the sound. Firstly, an EQ, which is rolling off everything above one kilohertz. Something that I think is evident straight away after hearing any of Burial's music is the consistent lack of high-end frequencies present in each one of his works, perhaps to emulate the sound of vinyl, be it a little more drastic. This could simply be applied in the mastering stage. There's no particular reason for applying it to separate sounds, but for me personally, I like focusing on one sound at a time, getting it to sit correct with the feeling of the track as well as working with the other sounds contained in the mix. I've got the effect tricks from Sugarbytes applying a stutter effect to the sound. There are plenty of free alternatives that can produce the same effect but this is my go-to for all things stutter. Even though it's such a small chop from the full static sample, the stutter effect helps to break up the block of noise giving it a little more character. The next plugin is then delaying the sound and the stutter. This is the new echo delay plugin that ships with Ableton 10 for those that don't recognize it. I was fortunate enough to be sent a beta copy of Live 10 from Ableton, thank you Ableton, and thought what better way than testing it out than making a track in the style of Burial. Back to the processing. The same effect can be applied with the simple delay plugin in Ableton if you copy these sync settings. The next effect is the vinyl start sound as I've named it, and it sounds like this.
It's just a free sound taken from, again, freesound.org, and it's simply a recording of a needle dropping on a record, which I've pitched down one octave. I'm also automating this whole effect bus down in pitch, as you can see here, and then back up at the beginning of the track. I thought this just introduced the track with a bit more character than just the raw sample. I think you all know that Burial loves experimenting with pitch, especially with his vocal sampling, which we will get into a little later. I'd hazard a guess that almost all of the musical sounds he's using have been manipulated in pitch in some fashion. The last effect is a random patch from On The Sphere 2 that sounds like so. There's nothing really worth speaking about with this other than if I were putting together a full burial composition, I would have tons of these kinds of effects peppered throughout the whole track. You could even export them to audio, bring them in on a new channel and time stretch or pitch shift them, turning them into drones or atmospheres. So that's it for the effects, moving on to the drums. Burial's drums are perhaps his most iconic feature, second only to his vocal sampling. Here's how the drums sound in this composition. I'll take you through each element quickly and then the processing on the group's bus. All of these sounds, as well as a couple hundred more, are from my burial sample pack, available now on Samples by Vanity, and it's listed and linked in the description below. Okay, so firstly, we've got the kick drum. Most of the work with drums, as I've stated before, is in finding the right sample to begin with in order to keep the processing to a minimum. The EQ is rolling off some of the lows under 30 hertz rather than the usual 50 hertz. Burial's kicks are very sub-centered. There's always a nice boom to them sitting around that 50 hertz mark, so I wanted to ensure that I kept that part of the kick in. The cut at 500 hertz for me just removes some muddy frequencies. Now, it could be argued that as burial sound is pretty raw and organic, that this isn't needed which is true. I'm just not a fan of how this frequency sounds. I've already spoke on why I'm removing the high end on certain sounds, so I won't speak on that again. But I'm using this compressor to round the tone of the kick drum. Burial's kicks are very smooth. They don't have a sharp attack that punches you in the face. It's more gentle and gradual. I think that people forget that you can change the whole character and tone of drum sounds using compressors. They're not just for controlling the dynamics. In fact, many analog compressors are used and loved for the particular the sound characteristics they have. Moving on to the snare, which sounds like this. Burial snares always seem to have a thick, wooden-like sounding quality to them, almost like striking a tree with a plank of wood. They're not snares in the normal sense, more of a pitch down rim shot combined with some kind of fan sounds, I'd imagine. The processing is identical to the kick drum, with the exception of rolling off the low end at 100Hz this time. A crucial point, perhaps the most important to achieving the sound of burial in your own drum groove, is of course the offbeat drum patterns. I know there are multiple ways of achieving this kind of sound, Many people will quantize their drums to some kind of swing grid or even go as far as to create their own swing grid settings from a pre-existing drum pattern. This is all fine, but it's not what Burial does, as he's working in Soundforge, which doesn't have a grid system like Doors, nor the ability to create ones. Now, personally, I like to do it the manual way. If I zoom in, you can see how the kick and snare are both offbeat. They both vary between hitting early, late, and almost on beat, as you can see here. To achieve this, I've literally just zoomed right in and moved each one back or forward slightly for 16 bars and then repeated it. In my opinion, this gives the most natural sound as quantizing to any grid, swing or not, will sound robotic when repeated enough times. Moving on, I've got this little low kick in here too, which sounds like so.
I noticed in a few of Burial's tracks that he's using ghost notes, sometimes in the form of kicks and also in the form of the bassline melody, which I found quite interesting. Ghost notes are just notes at very low volume, typically on the snare drum. I think this comes from Burial's garage influence that he's spoken about in various interviews. This kick was just my way of trying to get a similar feeling into this composition. I like to jump next to the channel titled Bullets, as I found this pretty interesting. I've got four different variations of bullet casings hitting a concrete floor, which sound like so. After researching burial sample sources, it became apparent pretty quickly that he has a particular love for the Metal Gear Solid video game series. Samples from this series have made it into many of his works, such as the main musical sound in Archangel, as well as much of his percussion coming from guns reloading, bullet casings impacting the floor, or the sound of the main character picking up an extra life. You can hear the bullet casings in tracks such as Near Dark, for example. Processing wise, I've left them at their original pitch, panned two of them 25 to the right and the other two 25 to the left. I've also added again the echo delay plugin to have them last a little longer as the original samples are pretty short. The final three channels are covered together as they're all various percussion sounds that have been time stretched, chopped and rearranged. Here's how they all sound together. If I show you the panning, you can see I've got them panned either to the left or right by 25. Burial seems to always be playing around with the space available in the stereo field, and this is something I wanted to try and emulate by opening up the percussion in this track to allow space for some of the more central elements of this drum groove to come through. I think many producers forget how much space is available to them in the stereo field and often don't take advantage of true stereo. Panning your percussion is almost a cheap trick to get your track sounding larger than life, especially if you've got a lot of centrally panned instruments in your mix already, as many have. So that is all of the sounds in the drum groove. Note that I've sent every sound by the kick drum and the low kick to my reverb bus. The processing on the group looks like so. The drum bus plugin is again a new plugin that ships with Ableton Live 10. Check out the difference it makes to the sound of the groove though. So first without, big right i didn't expect that either a similar sound can be achieved with some analog modeling plugins but this is just a neat analog style drum processor that i've been finding quite handy the eq is applying my pretty standard configuration rolling out the lows under 30 hertz leaving that area for the bass normally as i said before i'd take this to 50 hertz or even higher but i wanted to keep that boomy quality that is ever present in burials kick drums i've got the same going on at the opposite end of the spectrum rolling out everything above six kilohertz the percussion, as well as the snare, contained a lot of unwanted high frequencies that just made the whole drum groove sound bright and sharp, which is not in line with that of Burials. The lack of high end in Burials music, or perhaps the lack of volume within the high frequencies, is definitely a defining characteristic of his work. The dip at 500Hz, I'm almost always deploying to remove some of the muddy frequencies. Now, again, as I said before, this is just my own personal preference. It isn't something I'd say Burial definitely does. Whenever I'm working with a bunch of random random sounds that I've put together in a drum group like this. I find the glue compressor a necessity to ensure everything is glued together and sounding as one. It's important you control the dynamics of your drum grooves together in such a way if you wish them to sound as a cohesive beat 
which I'd say burials do. As you can see though, I've kept the processing very simple and minimal. I would guess Burial keeps it the same way, choosing to spend his time on sound selection and manipulation. I'd like to discuss this further, so let's move on to the vocals. Like most people, I'm a huge Burial fan, but if there's one thing I love most about his work, it's how he works with vocal samples. Everyone knows that Burial samples the majority, if not all of his vocals from various places, usually opting to draw from R&B. What many people do not realize is that he often samples from YouTube covers rather than the original track, as he's not bothered about the audio quality, it's all about the emotional value of the sample to him. On his vocals, Burial has said that he loved hearing a female neighbor sing to herself and the fact he could only hear her faintly through the walls in his flat gave him the idea for the far away or distorted vocals that he has become well known for. Burial said he wanted to ask her to record his neighbor singing but he didn't know her well enough to ask and he didn't want to invade her privacy. I found this quite interesting if too as it's definitely reflected in how he processes the vocals. Here's what I came up with for this track. They're not perfect, but they will help me demonstrate the processing techniques. To start with, the vocals come from the acapella you can see down here. Veronica, someone to hold. It's just one I happened to find on my computer that seemed to kind of work. I recommend spending a few hours YouTube digging for covers of R&B tracks if you're trying to achieve something similar to Burial. Getting the appropriate source material is half the battle. The next is the processing. I've noticed that Burial seems to use two or more different vocal phrases that are repeated throughout the track. As I'm sure you already know, Burial's pretty well known for how he plays with the pitch of his vocals. I found this to alternate between him pitch shifting the track up, down or both as well as automating the pitch across certain lyrics during a phrase. This is combined with time stretching, either the whole sample or just a portion of it in time with the lyrics. As with just which method to deploy, it will come down to the sample in question, the track and what combination of effects best suit the sample for the track. So I know it kind of seems obvious, but you just have to experiment until something starts to work. Case in point, in this track, I chose to just pitch shift the sample up four semitones, which probably took a few seconds, but I I spent many hours playing around automating the pitch during the sample but just couldn't get anything to sound right. I've also changed the formats to around 50%. One thing I did notice was that using this formant located down here can make the vocal sound more burial like. But note, you've got to be warping in the complex pro mode for this option to be there. Many people online have mentioned taking a more detailed approach to vocal editing or processing by using a program such as Maladyne. While that may work for you, it's also important to remember that that Burial uses Soundforge, the pitch editing capabilities of which being extremely basic and limited. Personally, I think much of Burial's sound comes from the samples he chooses, which of course carries over to the vocals. The type of vocals that Burial selects from has a very specific sound. Even if you get the processing perfect, if the sample you select isn't right, you'll still be left scratching your head. Back to the processing, which looks like so. Firstly, we've got an EQ removing a lot from the original sound. Burial high passes his vocals to give them that distant feel that I'm sure you're all very familiar with. To make this sound even more distant or to push the sound back in the mix, remove the lows and highs and apply some reverb. Delay can also help, but I recommend you understand the Fletcher Munson curve in order to have a better understanding of how the human ear responds to frequencies. You can fake distance with volume, but for me, while this can help enhance the effect, it's not a B and end all. The compressor isn't doing anything to actually affect the sound. I'm using it to keep the vocal at a constant level. I've also applied some volume automation, as you can see here, as I wasn't happy with just the compressor on its own. I needed something more drastic in order for the volume to stay at a constant level between the lyrics. It's also important to note that I make these adjustments by ear with the whole mix playing. I would not recommend working with instruments and sounds in solo in this type of music. It's much more important to hear how everything is sounding together and making your adjustments based on that. The next plugin is delaying the sound. Slightly different amounts in the left and right channels. The actual plugin I've used doesn't matter. The same sound can be achieved with the simple delay plugin. What I would like to say is whenever I'm using a delay, especially in this track i'm looking to delay the whole sample rather than just the word alone i want the whole when i'm alone phrase to be repeated 
to me, it sounds much more cleaner and natural as opposed to just delaying, say, the last word you like to emphasize. Another important factor is the volume of the delayed signal. I'm not looking for the delay to actually be obvious or even heard. It's serving the purpose of giving the sample a gentle fade out. If I were to remove the delay, you'd have the sample play once and then cut off. Even though I've applied a lot of reverb, it's not loud enough to actually allow the vocal to properly fade out. It's more serving as a space for the vocal sample to sit in. These are the kinds of things that you can pick out when not listening in solo. So if you take away anything from this vocal processing chapter, let it be that. I guess the reverb goes without saying. Rather than sending the vocal to the return channel, I've applied it directly to the sound so I could both have more reverb on the sound and be able to fine tune the settings to the vocal. This reverb preset, Wide Ambience, is one of my favorites. It's also the same as what I'm using on the returns as I want everything in this mix to sound like it's been recorded in one space or to collectively sound as one. I'll quickly cover the bass as this tutorial has gone on a little longer than I expected. Here's how it sounds. I've provided a download link to the massive patch below and you can see what processing I've applied if you'd like to copy it. It's a real simple hoover or resound that I've made in massive. Massive because I love having these macro controls. Being able to control multiple parameters on a synth with one macro control is pretty epic, especially for bass sounds. Burial's bass sounds are not all the same either. They actually vary quite a lot. I took inspiration from arguably his most well-known track, Archangel, for the bass as I felt it best demonstrated his work with low frequencies. The massive patch itself is just two saw waves, one detuned slightly, with some automation of the low pass filters cutoff, as you can see here. Opening up the filters cutoff in just the right places can take a little practice. For me, it was just a case of playing the track all together, drawing in the automation, editing until something finally worked. You could also try this live if you wish. Some of these slopes look like sharp changes, but audibly they're not. I'm almost just bringing in the bass now and again, as when the filter is almost closed down here, it gets pretty hard to hear. Burial's bass comes and goes. It's not constantly present with obvious note changes like many other artists. This filtering tried to emulate that to a certain extent, covering up the note changes, but closing and reopening it to introduce a new note. I won't keep repeating myself on the EQ and the compressor setup, but keeping your bass at a constant level is very important, especially if you're automating the tone or character of the sound as we are in here. This really applies over the whole mix. In my opinion, how well sounds are controlled in a mix is the biggest difference between an amateur and a professional mix. I really do hate that phrasing because there are no rules, but it gets the point across. Carrying on from that line of thinking, I'd like to speak about how I brought it all together in the mastering stage. As always, I kept the processing limited pun intended, to Ableton only plugins to show you that you don't need anything fancy other than your ideas. The two at the end here are a couple of different audio analyzers, the first of which is free. I've got the EQ in mid side mode and all it's doing is rolling out everything under 250 hertz off the sides of the record. This cleans up the sides of your track, ensuring everything below that frequency is in mono. The glue compressor is set on the lowest ratio as we're working on the master, taking off a maximum of between two to three decibels. I'm keeping this very light, just some gentle glue, helping everything gel a little bit more. And that's all I'm using it for. It's not doing any heavy work. I'm then using the utility plugin to boost the stereo image of the track by 27%. I couldn't quite get it on the 25, so 27 will have to do. It's kind of cheating a little, as really I should have deployed some more stereo effects, such as the Hass effect, to get a little more width in this mix. One thing I would push is that you focus on your stereo sound placement if you're going for a similar sound to Burial. Create a true sound world for listeners to get lost in. The limiter on the end here is taking off no more than 3 decibels on the gain reduction meter 
and I'm also leaving 0.2 decibels for any inter-sample peaks. Now, I'm boosting by 24 decibels as I mix this track very quietly. In fact, if I bypass this and play the track, you can see that I'm only hitting around minus 24 decibels on the master here. This is the best way round to do it. Don't mix loud and then turn down the master because you'll completely mess up your gain staging. It sounds much better to mix quietly, turn your interface's output up if needed, and then turn everything back up during the mastering stage. A quick piece of parting advice, there's nothing wrong with wanting your mix to sound more like someone else's. Oftentimes comparing yourselves to others is looked down upon as a negative process and while it can be in many aspects of your life, in order to improve your game in music production, you need to be able to objectively listen to and improve your own mixes. The best and easiest way to do that is using reference tracks. In regards to this track, it was important that I reference the mix to that of Burials. Now to do this, I played a few of Burials tracks through this span analyzer, took a screenshot of the spectrum, and then used this as a reference point for my mix. For example, oh, Burials high end starts to roll off around 10 kHz. Okay, then that's something I need to do in this mix. This is a great way to learn, and I do believe it will in turn help you to find out what you like and help you discover and develop your own sound. Listen and adapt. Damn, I really enjoyed this one. I hope you guys did too. Who should I cover next in this series? Comment your suggestions down below. Also, remember to enter the 10k subscriber giveaway to win some free music production gear. Thank you again for that. And until next time, I'm out. Peace.